Hello, my science lovers. This is a scientist Mel short, a shortened version of one of my larger live streams where we just talk about the content in general. This time we're talking about chaos theory. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, so today we are talking about chaos theory, life finds a way, all of the different things associated with the small things that cause the larger things to happen. So what we're gonna talk about today is what it is, where we see it, how it has an effect on things, and how scientists use chaos theory in science and um, how they actually use it to study different things because they actually do, it's pretty cool. So the first thing that we need to talk about on this is the beginning of chaos theory. We have Edward Lorenz in 1961 to thank for that. He discovered that his, his computer gave him really, really, really wrong answers when he started um, at, at, the, at the end of a series of calculations. Now, he started with this number 0 0.506127 and he found that um, the computer ended up rounding it to 0 0.506. Now the rounding off of that number made all of the difference. It shouldn't have, we were looking, he was working with um, weather forecasts, weather predictions. You wouldn't think that a small puff of the wind would have a huge effect on um, the ending results for weather conditions, but the rounding off of the number gave him vastly different results. Um, for a calculation that was completely different than what was expected. So the practical conclusion from this is that the long range type of weather forecasting is going to always be doomed to failure because there's no way to determine how it's going to be all the way down the road because there's different small little factors that play a role in how the weather play it plans out. Now. This is more like of not so much that we don't have good instruments to measure the weather, but more like the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. There are very, very, very distinct and specified limits to how far we can predict future events. And we kind of lose that certainty. So after a period of time, we kind of lose that 100% certainty of this is how it's going to be the longer things go on. And we kind of see this every day in our world. So in our, in our world, as we walk around, we see that for every event that occurs, small little uncertainties kind of multiply over a period of time. So this allows almost like a domino effect towards unpredictability. Now, if we look at human beings, humans are extremely complex. And so, we see that early childhood events can have an effect on humans later on in their adult life. We also know that people aren't just automatically born as a blank slate. We have in place desires and traits that are products of our genetic code. So these small changes in our genetic code can also have an influence on who we are as people. Young. Um, in 1989 kind of notes that there's an enormous influence that childhood has on the later development of character. And he also points out that a lot of their neuroses that we see that are misdevelopments in the adults, they happen to be built up over years and years and years and years. And so we have small things that kind of multiply and change over time and have an effect on us later on in life. This is kind of what chaos theory is. So what is it overall? <laughs> it's the science of surprise. It's unpredictable phenomenon. All of these different things kind of play a role in chaos theory. So let's talk a teeny bit more about that before we hop in to the meat of the thing. Chaos theory studies the science of surprise. Most science strives to study the predictable for repetition and understanding of how things work. Look at gravity, chemical reactions, behaviors that are repeatable under highly specific conditions. And it also has an, a linear effect. 
we do more to a particular thing, more of something happens. Cause and effect that we see, and we can mathematically kind of play that out, whether it's gravity or chemical reactions, that sort of thing. Now, chaos theory looks at unpredictability, things that are not linear and all of the factors that can influence a particular thing. It looks at fractal properties and chaotic behaviors in order to study the unexpected. While scientific laws give us repeatability under specific conditions, chaos theory looks at things we cannot control. Turbulence, weather, brain patterns, and brain states, stock market, sports, recognizing and understanding the expected in nature and society, and the unexpected in these systems helps us gain insight that the smallest thing we would not normally expect could cause the long term to collapse, even as far as a detrimental type of collapse. So when we're looking at chaos theory, before it was a thing, somebody would see something weird, well, it's just because it's so complex. There's so many things involved. Or it's just noise. Well, we have to talk a little bit about what complexity and noise actually is before we can dive into chaos theory. So. Before it was a thing, before 1961, before chaos became a thing, science would have to consider erratic or random appearance of behavior in the natural world for two reasons, complexity and noise. Complexity first takes into account that there are lots of degrees of freedom, also known as variables, that are needed in order to pin down the state of a system at a particular time, like a snapshot of it. So we could look at a box of gas or a galaxy of stars, like a galaxy of stars. That system has so many variables involved with it that it has the strong possibility of showing extremely complicated behavior. It looks random, but it's really not random because there's so many things involved with it. So when we're looking at before the chaos theory, they were just like, it's just so complex. That's why it looks erratic. Noise, that addresses behavior that is influenced by outside and random effects, such as temperature changes, mechanical vibration. So mechanical vibrations might be causing this erratic looking behavior. Now for this reason, it shows this type of weird behavior. Now, chaos theory allows us to have a third reason for complex behavior. It's important because it works to explain complicated, apparently random behavior we observe as systems with only a few variables involved that are not really affected by any kind of noise. So these are things that we know exist and we're like, well, it's not linear and that's funny. Chaos theory has a very specific um, ingredients in order for something to be considered chaotic. So let's talk about fractals. These are never ending patterns that are infinitely complex and they're also self similar across many different scales. So essentially fractals, um, they're created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop. So they're kind of driven by de de um, recursion. Fractals are images of dynamic systems or the pictures of chaos, essentially. Now, geometrically, they exist in between our familiar dimensions. Now, fractal patterns are extremely f um, f familiar. Ha! Ah. <laughs> Don't you love it when I trip over my words? It's funny. So, since nature is full of fractals, we see this everywhere. We see trees, rivers, coastlines, mountains, clouds, seashells, hurricanes. We see these patterns, these never ending patterns but they're all driven by this recursion and they're essentially snapshots of chaos. Now we also have attractors, both strange and non-strange. Attractors are a set of numerical values where a dynamics that are in a dynamic system where these systems tend to move towards. So you'll have a certain set of values you expect this behavior to kind of evolve towards. Now, when a system value gets close enough to that expected evolved attractor value, it remains close to that value, even if the system is slightly disturbed. So you have strange and non-strange attractors. Now, complex systems sometimes appear to be too chaotic, yet they run through their own cycles. Now, oftentimes these situations are rarely, rarely duplicated. We don't see them, but they still 
run through similar cycles. A strange attractor is representative of a system that runs from situation to situation, but it never settles down. It's still going to have some kind of type of pattern. So here is a picture of different types of attractors. So we have a strange attractor over there. Now it looks kind of like in that form where it's still gonna run through this particular pattern. Now it's interesting, you turn it sideways, it looks like a butterfly. That's a strange attractor. Point attractor is kind of closer to a black hole movement, you know, kind of thing like that. You have a cycle where your standard cycle, where it's going around this loop right here. Then you have your torus attractor. So we've, we're mostly focusing on the strange attractors because we are talking about chaos theory. Woohoo! So one quote that I like by Einstein. As far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. Um, I can't remember who the scientist was, but one of my favorite quotes is, if you think you understand quantum, then you don't understand quantum. And then there's also Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The more you know about the momentum of electron, the less you know about the location where it's at. So it's kind of like chaos theory says, the more you know about one particular thing, um, one particular variable of a thing, the less you know about another variable, which is kind of interesting. But, you know, quantum is absolutely amazing. One of my favorite things to kind of talk about. <laughs> now we're at the butterfly effect. This is probably something that you are more familiar with. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions. That means the more we know about the initial conditions of the start of something the more we can figure out what's going with the, like as far as predict the possibilities down the road. So that's kind of what the butterfly effect is. But the question here is, can a butterfly's flap of a wing cause a tornado in Texas? Well, the butterfly effect grants the power to cause this. This idea does not mean an instantaneous, instantaneous tornado with a butterfly. It may take a very long time, but it introduces the very real connection of the small things interacting with the larger things. Now, if the butterfly had not flapped its wing at just that right point in space and time, the tornado would not have happened. Another way to explain this is that the small changes in the initial conditions lead to drastic changes in the results. We see this effect in our daily lives. And there's one specific example that I like to kind of bring up. And this particular example deals with Seth MacFarlane in 9-11. So Seth MacFarlane is a, the Family Guy creator. He missed his flight on 9-11 due to being out late the night before and his assistant putting well, his travel assistant putting the wrong time on his calendar. Now he was due to be on one of the flights that hit the twin, one of the twin towers, but these two small variables, him being out late, him sleeping late, essentially him sleeping late and his travel assistant putting the wrong time on his calendar. These two small variables saved his life. So this is something that we kind of have to take into consideration. Um, had those two variables, those two small things slightly changed, he might have been on that flight. And then we wouldn't have Seth MacFarlane anymore. But this is kind of what we mean by small little things that have a drastic change on events. And it completely changed his life for that. So let's talk about what we mean by sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Consider this quote from Simon de Laplace in 1820. And I might have said his name wrong, so I'm sorry. Given for one instant, an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective positions of the beings which compose it, if, moreover, this intelligence were vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in the same formula both the movements of the largest bodies in the universe and those of the lightest atom. To it, nothing would be uncertain, and the future as the past would be present to its eyes. And that's Pierre Simon de Laplace 
1820. So let's break this down a little bit. What does this mean? Essentially, he's saying if we know the initial conditions of a system with enough accuracy, we can effectively prevent future behaviors within that system, potential future behaviors. This isn't really going to work for every single case because it's not really practical, but it can be plausible for simple systems with only just a few variables that are not affected by any kind of outside influence. It's what we call noise. But even for simple systems, this probably is not possible. This may not be possible. Poincar enlightens us with his thoughts and have probably said his name wrong too. Um, so <laughs> here is his quote. If we knew exactly the laws of nature and the situation of the universe at the initial moment, we could, pre we could predict exactly the situation of that same universe at a succeeding moment. But even if it were the case that the natural laws had no longer any secret for us, we could only still know the initial situation approximately. If that enabled us to predict the succeeding situations with the same approximation, that is all we require. And we should say that the phenomenon had been predicted, that it is governed by laws, but it is not always so. It may happen that small differences in the initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomenon. A small error in the former would produce an enormous error in the latter. Prediction becomes impossible and we have the fortuitous phenomenon. So that's Pon Carr. So essentially, it, even if we know every single little bit of possible information from the initial conditions, and even if all of the laws of nature are revealed to us and we have no more questions about it, we could only still know the initial situation approximately. We can never really know exactly all of the conditions in that initial situation. So that's how, what Punk, um, um, Poincare has to say about that, or Poincare, it might be Poincare. So let's talk about that particular situation. <laughs> the water drop scene from Jurassic Park, life finds a way. <laughs> so a film example of sensitive dependence on initial conditions is the water drop scene in Jurassic Park. The drop could roll anywhere down her hand, and this clearly has a big influence on the future of the drop. However, the sensitivity to the initial conditions only arises for one particular case. If the drop starts on one side of her hand, the sensitivity disappears and it is left with how it rolls down her hand. To describe this motion as chaotic, we would require sensitivity to initial conditions for a wide range of such conditions. Now we're getting into math. Ah, ah, the maths, you know. So chaos involves an exponential divergence of trajectories. So here we have the equation regarding trajectories and how that kind of works. So trajectory is defined as a particular way in which the system might evolve. If a system is chaotic, then two trajectories that differ by delta x zero in their initial conditions will after a period of time t differ by delta x times t is equal to de delta x zero and then we have the exponential function um, and then here is the particular this alpha type of um, variable i normally use that for absorbance so the chemist in me wants to say absorbance t but i'm pretty certain that's not what they mean there because here it's called the lyapunov exponent and must be positive for chaotic behavior so it always has to be positive for chaotic behavior now note the future behavior of a chaotic system is predictable but only if only if the state of the system is known to infinite precision so in practice that's not possible <laughs> it's never possible and so any real prediction is useless after a certain period of time so how long is that time that's the question all right now we're talking about is it chaos yes no maybe what is it well Chaos um, has very specific ingredients, and the two things that are required for a system to be in chaos is three degrees of freedom. There must be three variables involved, and it must be nonlinear. So, a simple pendulum only has two degrees of freedom. So, the two degrees of freedom, one is the position, and the other one is velocity. 
Adding a periodic driving force adds another degree of freedom, another variable. So to describe the system at a specific time t, we need to specify the phase of the driving force at that time. Making a single pendulum into a double pendulum adds two extra degrees of freedom, the position and the velocity of the second pendulum, thus bringing about the chaos. So we have the double pendulum example here with this particular GIF image. So now we have more than three degrees of freedom and we have the chaos. Isn't that neat? All right, the second thing it must be. So we've got the three degrees of freedom, but it also must be non-linear. What does that mean? Well, in a linear system, all of the variables, position, velocity, pressure, all of that tend to appear in the equations at, to the first power and not, not at all. So if we look at the ideal gas law, PV NRT, that's so many people are just, oh man, PV NRT, that's the ideal gas law. So here's what we mean. So if we increase a certain variable, we expect others to increase and decrease. So if we increase the temperature, we expect the pressure to increase. If we increase the volume, we expect the pressure to decrease. So if we were to take this particular situation and kick it a linear system twice as hard, then the response will always be twice as large. So if we double up that temperature, we expect the pressure to double up as well. Now in reality, all physical symptoms are nonlinear at some level and linearity is only approximation. So the chemist in me, when I'm trying to determine the, um, the lin when we're looking at a, a particular solution about being able to determine the concentration of a particular thing, we can reach where it's no longer linear. We cannot count that within our anything outside of our perfect linearity because we don't know. Our, our certainty goes away. So even in chemistry, you can reach a point to where you cannot effectively determine the concentration of something once linearity is lost. So we might have a, a nice little graph, you know, you know, our, our maybe making a nice line, but once it starts to kind of taper out, you're like, no, we, we can't, we can't use these numbers here because we don't have our perfect linearity anymore. So is it chaos? Must have at least three degrees of freedom and it must not be linear. So that's where we kind of bring about the PV NRT thing. All right, what about evolution? <laughs> what about evolution? Rosen in 1991 stated, the natural evolution of quasi-isolated systems should be analyzed by considering the evolution process as a sequence of states in time. A state is the condition of the system at any time, and this can be either discrete or it can be continuous. At any time, we can consider the system state as the initial conditions for whatever processes follow. So, if we're looking at evolution, we're looking at a species and the evolution of a species, we can take a look at each condition where we kind of see the divergence of species and go, okay, well, what can we predict to go on down the road here? But you have to look at that particular state that it's in, each individual one, in order to determine where it might be going next. So we can look at, okay, look at people now. Here's where we are now. What are the ways that we can predict down the way if we know the initial conditions? But the thing is the initial conditions can be determined if you take a snapshot at that moment in time and see what was going on around it, then you can kind of predict how it would go. That's essentially what that means. So let's talk a little bit more about evolution. <laughs> oh, I like my new glasses. They're pretty cool. All right. Evolution is driven by a, by a natural selection. While we can always expect a response from a stimulus, especially in living systems, there are always many possibilities. However, the initial state is always going to be the determining factor for the long term. As the state changes, the responses can and will change. Chaos theory tells us to expect the unexpected, but we can predict if we have sufficient information. Newton's laws describe classical mechanics. We expect objects to remain in motion unless acted on by an outside force. This is predictable. However, the trajectory of where we are going can change if we have more than two variables. We can destroy ourselves as a society and a species the more variables we put into the equation. And there are responses that are factors that can breed chaos. 
life finds a way as we organize the chaos through information, thus in th information theory. But that is another talk. By the way, if you're interested in that kind of thing about information theory in regard to um, biological systems, check out The Touchstone of Life, fantastic book by Lowenstein. So, also, chaos theory is actively used in biology. Scientific American had an article where they used chaos theory to revitalize certain fisheries. That there happen to be fewer fish in the sea than ever. Now, complexity theory argues for mathematician George Sugihara, he provided a counterintuitive way to revitalize the world's fisheries based on chaos theory. I suggest you check out that article sometime. It's really cool. And if you want to know about where you can get that article, just go to scientistmail.com. All of my slides are posted there. You can download them, click on the links, and kind of dive in a bit further. So that brings us to the end of our talk. Chaos theory. What is it? We talked about what it is. We've talked about where we see it, how it affects on a particular thing, and how scientists use it. So I do have a lot of sources here. These are actually pretty cool type of stuff. Um, Fractal Foundation. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot, Scientific American. There's a lot of different sources here. If you're not, just go to my website, scientistmail.com, and you can check out all of the sites, all the stuff that I have there to where you can download and kind of investigate further. So I'm going to say thank you to my patrons. I have a new one named Richard. Thank you, Richard. So we got Tony James, Lauren Jen, Carl, Melanie, Patrick, Daniel, Stephen, Paula, Tim, Carrie, Cersei, Keith, Duke, Andy, Zachary, Tony, Bo, Stephen, Sarah, Chris, Graham, Dragnot, Carlos, Iowan, Jennifer, Corey, and Heavy. And now, Richard, thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for helping me keep the lights on and do what I do. All of your contributions go directly to what I do here, maintenance, websites, gear. I got my new microphone. Thank you, guys. I appreciate having you here with me. And you mean the world to me. And please don't forget you have rewards. If you find a piece of artwork, if you're one of my higher level patrons, please shoot me a message and let me know which piece of artwork you would like and I can send it to you because I do have artists that do stuff for my show. Yay! All right, where can you find me? Everywhere on the internet. Scientistmail.com, patreon.com slash scientistmail, Periscope, YouTube, Facebook. I'm all over the place. I'm on, also on Twitch as well. You can find me in all the things. I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. Chaos Theory. That's what it's been. So this has been a Scientist Mail short Thank you so much for being here. Have a fantastic day, my science lovers. Bye!